church. Happy Sunday. We're so glad that you're here to worship and get into the word with us. My name is Bree, and before we enter a time of worship together, would you just join me in a short word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much that we can come before you to worship you, to lift up your name, and to hear and receive from you and your word. God, these times don't make it easy to stay connected to a church family or congregation, but Lord, we know that you see us, Lord, that you are with us, and that you honor the heart that comes before you in spirit and in truth, just to lift up your name and to seek to connect to you, Father God. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus. He is the reason we have won access to you, Father. So it doesn't matter whether we come to you from our living rooms, our church lawn, or anywhere else, Lord, we can come boldly before the throne of grace because of all that has been afforded to us through your son, Jesus Christ. And so we just lift this time up to you in his holy name, amen. Sing Jesus. Jesus, lift up Jesus. Sing the name that overcomes. Savior. Savior, he has freed us. Lift up Jesus. Lift him up. One more time. Jesus. Jesus, lift up Jesus. Sing the name that overcomes. Savior, He has freed us. Lift up Jesus, lift Him up. And praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is your health and salvation. Come all who hear, now to His temple draw near. Join me in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord. Praise to the Lord above all things so wondrously reigning. Sheltering you under his wings and so gently sustaining. Have you not seen all that is needful as been? By His gracious ordaining. Grace, grace to the Lord who will prosper your work and defend you. Surely His goodness and mercy will daily attend you. And ponder anew what the Almighty can do If with His love He befriend you oh, We adore you, Lord oh. Let's sing joyful Joyful, joyful we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Sing that again, joyful. Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun
praise to the Lord who let all that is in me adore Him. All that has life and breath come with your praises before Him. Let the Amen sound from His people again. Gladly forever adore search me how you know me you perceive my every thought from afar and all my wandering still you love me O King of glory you pursue my anxious heart even when your faithful even when I doubt your truth holds even when I'm lost you won't let me go when my heart is dry your grace flows no matter where I run I'm not far from home yeah maybe weak but you're able even when I'm not your faith that again Lord you search Lord you search me how you know me you perceive my every thought from afar in all my wandering still you love me oh king of glory you pursue my anxious heart oh your faith even when I doubt your truth holds even when I'm lost you won't let me go when my heart is dry your grace flows no matter where I run I'm not far from home yeah I may be weak but you're evil go where can I go from your spirit where can I hide from your face where can I flee from your presence where would I go where would I go if I rise to the heavens you with me if I fall to the depths of the sea even there it's your hand that will lead me wherever I go wherever I go Down your truth holds. Even when I'm lost, you won't let me go. Oh, when my heart is dry, your grace flows. No matter where I run, I'm not far from home. Yeah, maybe weak, but you're evil.
Father God, this morning, we thank you and praise you for your faithfulness. Lord, for the, the time after time that you've extended your grace and your mercy toward us, withholding judgment and instead offering forgiveness. You are so faithful, God. And we thank you for that today. We praise you and celebrate you today. Amen. Amen, church. Well, hey, let's take a minute now, and, and I'd love for us to pray together uh, just over the, the offering, the gifts uh, that have been given this week to the kingdom of God. Thank you for all of you who uh, have given. There's a few different ways you can give if you'd still like to online, sending something in through the mail. But regardless of, of if you gave or how you give, would you all uh, join me just in praying? And we want to dedicate these gifts to the Lord and in his kingdom work. So Father God, uh, you are the owner, the creator of all things. And we thank you that you have given or allowed us to borrow some, something from you. Everything that we have is, is from you and of you. And we're just so thankful. And so we take some of that and give it back to you today with thanksgiving and with gratitude in our heart toward you, our Father, our God. Would you bless it and receive it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Jeff Buck. I am so happy to have you for the Sunday service here at Calvary Monterey. I'm so grateful for those of you who are watching online and also for those who will be meeting simultaneously at our church, out on the lawn and in their cars. We are making the, the best that we can in these days of COVID-19. And you know, uh, as our pastor Manny Colazzo here on staff says, the kingdom of God is not in trouble. So I am thankful that you're here with us as we continue uh, our search through for uh, truth in scripture. We also have the elements of communion here that you'll see. And so you are free at the end of this message to share communion with us. If you have those elements in the house, you can run and get them now. Uh, some kind of a juice or wine, some kind of bread, and we will remember the Lord's death until his coming as we conclude. Hey, we're going to be today in a, a great passage that our pastor Nate Holdridge shared with us a few weeks back. And if you'll get your Bible and you'll go to Mark chapter 6, uh, a New Testament gospel that is written originally to the Romans. It's an action gospel. And I love uh, this passage that Nate shared with us a few weeks back. And I'm going to go over it lightly because he already taught it. And then it just occurred to me, I'm going to go to one of the parallel passages in uh, Matthew 14. And you'll see in the parallel passage an incident that is not included in the basic text here of Mark chapter 6. So faith is the underlying theme of this message. Uh, I call this message, Can I Do That? Because you're going to see in this second passage in Matthew 14, our dear friend, the impetuous Peter, who decides that he should be doing what Jesus is doing. And we'll read what that is right now. Mark chapter six, verse 45. Immediately, one of the most common words in the book of Mark occurs, I think 43 times, immediately he made his disciples, and this is after the feeding of the 5,000 and that miraculous time, to get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. After he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. When evening came, the boat with the disciples, he had sent them out, uh, was out on the sea, and he is alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully before, uh, because the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. I believe it happened exactly like that. And as Pastor Nate talked about this, he meant to pass by them. He had said, go to this certain city, and he was, he was headed there. 
he meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the water, they completely, as many people have done through history, they misidentified him and they thought it was a ghost. And so they cried out. Grown men were really, really afraid. And they all saw him and were terrified. And immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. He gets into the boat with them and the wind immediately ceases. And they're utterly astounded at this miraculous event for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. So this is a wonderful story of Jesus walking across the sea and some of the underlying themes here are so beautiful. He's had a, a long, supernaturally soaked ministry day, feeding the 5,000, teaching perhaps 15,000 people. And he needs time alone. And not just time to rest, not just time by himself, but obviously time to pray. That was the lifeblood of Jesus' energy, his passion, his courage as, as the Son of God, Son of Man. And that was this relationship with God. So he dismisses the crowd with that voice of authority. And he's alone on the land. Now you saw here and heard here that Jesus comes on the fourth watch of the night. The Romans divided the watch, watches in the night from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And this was the fourth watch. So this was the last watch of the night so sometime between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., Jesus is making this trip. So it says that when evening came, the boat's on the sea, he's alone. So I'm assuming that this would be perhaps 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, we don't really know. But if he, is, if he starts to pray right around that time, and he comes walking on the water between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., he has spent six, eight hours alone with the Father. And there is something about extended prayer. Anybody can pray for 15 minutes with passion or 30 minutes, but when you spend eight hours with God, your passion there is connection, relationship, intimacy, strength, and all of that I'm sure was happening as God the Son was speaking to God the Father. Eight hours of prayer. I think the longest prayer meetings I can remember continuous were three hour prayer meetings that we used to attend every week in Kansas City. And I remember about an hour and a half into those meetings, there would always be a, a stillness, a silence, a almost thick with the anticipation and presence of God because everyone was just prayed out. and in those quiet moments you waited for the person who was going to pray next and whatever that was it was going to be deep fantastic intercession prayer and so who knows what this particular time looked like but prayer he starts walking across the sea they see him they think he's a ghost the greek word a uh, phantasma would, in, would indicate just an apparition of some sort, and they don't realize that it's Jesus. And as Nate shared with us, he simply says this three-phrase sentence, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And that middle phrase, it is I, in the Greek language, ego emi, uh, is actually just the words I am. And obviously, Jesus is relating to the strong tradition in the Old Testament that God was known as the I Am. You, you can hardly describe who he is. He's, he's just the I Am. And so he is, he is expressing divinity. It's okay. We're going to take care of things. And then uh, he gets into the boat, the wind stops, and they are just amazed. And they, they don't understand completely the significance of the moment. And it says that their hearts were hardened. They had seen miracles that day. And somehow, even though they had been taught by Jesus to walk in the supernatural and they lived around it, their hearts were hardened, which is something you always want to guard against. 
over-familiarity with your faith, uh, making your faith overly complex and sterile. You never want your heart to be anything but childlike and open and supple before God. So that's the story as, as Nate taught it, I think on June 18th. Let's go though to the parallel passage in Matthew 14. This is one of the thing that, uh, things that a devoted Bible student will do, and that is find other places in the Bible that will give illumination and light on the passage that you start with. And between <laughs> verses 50 and 51 of the passage in Mark 6, there's a little story that Mark does not share, Matthew does. And it's, it's a, a wild story. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, and he again dismissed the crowds. After he dismissed the crowds, verse 23, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. Notice his purpose was clear from the start. I am staying here to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, and I, I like this next little phrase, beaten by the waves. I don't know if you've ever had your boat, your life beaten up, but literally this was happening to them, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., somewhere in there, he came to them walking on the sea. Basically the same story uh, as Mark. When the disciples see it, verse 26, they see him walking on the sea. They are terrified. And again, they say it is a phantasm. It is a ghost. They cried out in fear. And again, immediately, Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. I am. Do not be afraid. Now, that, I love the story to that point. I think it's, a, it's great. It's a interesting. It's supernatural. I mean, it's wonderful. But we have to then go to verse 28, and we have to see Peter, the apostle's response. And I never, never would have had this response, I don't think, nor would I have ever anticipated it if I was one of the 12 in the boat with Jesus, that one of us would then pop up and say this. Verse 28, Peter answered him, now that he's found out who it is, and says this, Lord, if it is you, if it is you, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Now that's incredible. He says, can I do that? Can I walk on the water and come to you? Now here's a man who grew up on boats, lived in boats, and knew all about stepping over the side of a boat. I mean, it's always the same way. When you decide you're going to exit your boat, you're going to have to stick one leg over, shift your weight, and then it's too late. You're, you're, you're going over the side, hopefully onto the dock. And he says, command me. Now, I think what he knew was if, if Jesus would give him that authoritative word, and he'd seen the power of the words of Jesus, how trustworthy Jesus is, and how powerful. He knew that if he could get that permission, he could experience what his master was doing. And I love the fact that Jesus simply says, come, come, just one word. Within that word was the permission for the supernatural. Within that word was the encouragement to walk in the supernatural and the command to do so. So, Peter stands up, puts one leg over, shifts his weight, and I, I would imagine his mind was thinking so fast on the way down, or maybe it didn't, but maybe he was thinking, what have I done? What am I doing? Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. And you know, any miracle that the Lord, whether it's an everyday life miracle or something really, really big and significant, miracles are simply there to help us come to Jesus. And he actually walks on the water 
and comes to Jesus. Now, I think that's wonderful. I, I want to just turn to a, another little parallel passage to just comment on Peter's audacity in his faith. And we have to understand that Jesus says mentoring and discipling these 12 disciples to turn them into apostles, sent ones to send them out. And after his departure to heaven, everything will rest on the 12 disciples. And part of the training we can read in Matthew chapter 10, and I just want to pick it up in verse 6. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Go to your Jewish brothers and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What a message to go out to people and say, you know, you thought about God, you thought about heaven, you thought about the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is here. The kingdom of heaven has come. The kingdom is now. What a message. And what are they going to do after they make that initial pronouncement? Here's what Jesus has said to them. Verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Four incredible supernatural things. And I love, he says right after that, you received without paying, so you give freely without pay. No, another version says, freely you have received, freely give. Well, what did that mean? Well, they had been watching Jesus do these very things heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, and had, to some extent, participated in it. And this was what Jesus was training these men to do, to walk in the supernatural, or if you will, step out of the boat. I love this passage. And especially, you received without paying, give without pay. These men would be known for going into cities large and small, poor and rich, and freely sharing the supernatural touch of Jesus upon their lives and the message of his death, his burial, his resurrection, so that sins can be forgiven because Jesus is alive and lived the perfect life and will forgive you. So back here in verse 30. So everything is going well initially, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cries out and he prays, he prays the perfect prayer. Lord, save me. I'm sure he shouted it and didn't say it in some religious manner. Lord, save me. And I, I think it's interesting in verse 30, it says he saw the wind, meaning he saw the effects of the wind on the water and it flipped him out. Things that you see can really, really flip you out and, and that's what happened here and then he begins to look around and realize what is what am i doing here he begins to think and analyze in the middle of this miracle but he has the sense to cry out lord save me and verse 31 jesus immediately reached out his hand took hold of him I like the fact that he didn't just let him like sink, uh, let him get a few mouthfuls of water, anything like that. He immediately reaches down. He immediately took hold of him and said to him this really interesting little sentence. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? In the original language where it says, oh, you of little faith, it's simply a compound word, little faith, little faith. It's like a name calling him like a name. Hey, Little Faith, how'd you like to have that name, Little Faith? People ask you, what's your name? Little Faith. And you'd forever be branded as the person that has no faith, Little Faith. Little Faith, why did you doubt? And he said that because he had said the word, come. And you'll learn that about Christ is he is so faithful and true and stays with the things he encourages you to do. And once he says, come in whatever it is, you got to stick with it and don't let doubt sink you. 
That's the way you stay in a long-term marriage. That's the way you stick with kids that are in rebellion. That's the way that you face COVID and say, well, Lord, I don't understand this storm that I'm in, but I know that you love me. And I know that you're saying to me, come, continue to walk with you. And when they got into the boat, again, the wind ceased. I would have loved to have experienced that. The wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. Now in the other passage, it said they were utterly astounded and their hearts were hardened. That was Mark's impression of it. Matthew's impression and his recitation of it is, truly, you are the son of God. What a story. And oh, I wish that uh, walking on water and things like that uh, happened in my life every day. I wish that I saw every day literal miracles, although I have seen some in my life. But I want to ask myself, why am I not, or why are we not more like Peter? Because the hero of this story isn't Peter, it's Jesus. Jesus, the trustworthy, the faithful, the, the everlasting and loving friend of ours. Why are we not more like Peter in the areas in which God and his word encourage us to trust? Um, I think, number one, the walking on water made no sense to the mind. And, you know, the Lord has permission to ask us to do things that sometimes just don't seem to make sense to our mind. And number two, they were afraid. They were just literally afraid. The other 11 disciples are looking at the same uh, scene as Peter, and it makes no sense that anyone walks on water. And number two, they're afraid. And number three, I think the other disciples and perhaps me today is I don't want to look foolish. I don't want to attempt something, fall flat on my face, and then look around at people laughing at me and think, oh, I just look foolish. But the fourth reason that we don't get out of the boat more is maybe no one else is getting out of the boat. There's nobody else doing that thing that we know we should do or we feel we should do and we seem to be the only one in a particular situation that is hearing Jesus say, come. Let me just talk about faith for a moment. That is a word that if you're new to the Bible or new to Christianity or just checking it out, uh, you may not have heard a lot about. It's interesting, uh, in the Thayer's Greek Lexicon of the New Testament, I kind of learned about that book from Pastor Nate, I looked up the word for faith, the, the noun and the verb, just thinking, well, what is the word in its original language, the, the Greek uh, translated here into English? What does it really mean? And I was surprised at what the noun faith and the verb faith actually mean in, in the root language. The noun for faith means this, trust worthiness, trustworthiness, something that it's safe to put your trust in. The verb for trust, pistueo, it means to trust. The word for faith means trust. So, you know, when I think about this, I think in some ways I can relate to trust maybe a little better than faith because Trust is something that I have to do quite all the time. I hand over cash at the bank and I'm trusting that they're putting it in my account and it'll be there later. Or I see a, a chair in the room and I sit down in it. I'm not afraid that it's going to fall on the ground or fall into pieces. I trust it. I've been married 47 years, going on 48, and I trust, trust my wife with anything. Trusting is what causes us to look at a situation when we're thinking that maybe there's a, a solution that, that's kind of outside the box and we pray 
and we feel maybe not in every case, but in this case, God wants me to step out of the boat. No one else is doing it. I don't want to look foolish. I, I, it makes no sense to my mind. Let me just give you an example of some, some people that I know that have done this exact exercise. A couple I've shared before, a couple I haven't. But uh, many, many years ago, 1949, 1950, uh, a young pastor who was trying to be ordained after finishing his Master of Divinity, his three years after college, he's in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and he is, is not finding a local church, which is the way it worked, to, uh, to serve and to process through a diaconate time to ordination. And he just wants to serve God as an ordained pastor. And uh, here he sits trying to figure out what to do. And uh, he has the idea of calling the denominational superintendent of the state of Massachusetts near where uh, he once lived. And so he, he calls and he asks the, the official, is there any possibility that, that I could get started, that you have a church there that would need me because I, I want to be ordained? And as in other phone calls, uh, the official said to him, sir, I'm sorry, I, I do not have a church open for you. And he hesitated a moment, he said, but you know, if you want to come here in faith, if you want to come here in faith, pack up all your stuff and come, you know, uh, you're, you're free to do that. And we'll see no, no commitment, but you could come. And so this man heard through this whole situation, the word of Jesus to come. All he had in the world could be could fit in his station wagon, his young wife, his young one-year-old son, and everything else fit in this station wagon. So he makes the drive from New Mexico to Massachusetts to Boston and leaves wife and child outside. He goes in and uh, talks to this official. And the man looks at him and said, now, this is amazing. While you have been driving here, one of our pastors under my oversight, he, he died this week. His widow is so distraught that she just left. And they, she left everything they own in the house, everything. There's sheets on the bed, there's beautiful chairs, there's silverware in the drawers. Everything's there. So he said, I know that would be a problem for you uh, to, to put all your stuff in there also, but if you would like to live in that home and to pastor that church, I will help you. The thing that that official did not know was all my father had left in his pocket was 57 cents. No credit cards in those days, no ways of navigating without cash. And he showed up in faith, having shifted his way out of the boat, and he walked on water in that sense. That really happened. That was my own father. I have in my home now a chair that comes from that home some 60 years ago, whatever it was. And if I want to think about faith, if I want to think about trust, I just sit in that chair put my hand on the arms, and I just let that concept of launching out encourage me. I, I love that story, especially because it's true. And so I, in my youth, 19 years old, I'm a, I'm a young pastor, and I'm, I'm a full-time student, I'm a full-time pastor, I'm working a weekend job, Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, doing ministry engagements on Sundays, and I'm in an outreach singing group. And you know, I was, I was bold enough to then do something else on top of all that. I asked Denise to marry me. So I'm an engaged man doing all this stuff. And I was the laziest kid in high school. 
how I got in this situation of such passion and energy to be able to do all this stuff and actually make it work, finish my college education and marry my wife. But I learned this lifestyle of trust, believing that I was supposed to do all these things. It's wild. I found myself able to do them. Everyday life bathed in the come, bathed in the following of Christ, trusting him in everything. And I've seen some just amazing situations through the years where I just had no idea how to handle something, but I knew that God wanted me to step into it, so I did. I was a conference speaker and editor and writer for a stretch of time between churches. And so I was preparing uh, to go up and speak at a, a church in St. Louis, Missouri. I was living in Fort Lauderdale at the time. And so I'm going up for a Friday, Saturday, coming back Sunday. And about 6 a.m. Friday morning, the day I'm going to catch a plane and go, the phone in my home office rings. I pick it up, and it is the wife of the pastor who's invited me to his church. And she tells me, and I'm, you know, barely awake, she tells me, uh, you, you don't need to come. Uh, my husband, the pastor, he died at his desk last night. He had a massive heart attack at his desk. He was, he was stuffing bulletins for your conference and he was getting ready for the weekend. And uh, I don't expect you to come. Well, I was astounded in this moment, but something inside me said, don't, don't say no, don't say you're not coming. Uh, hang up and think about it and pray about it and call her back. And I did. And this overwhelming peace inside me said that I should go. I called her back and said, I'm coming. Catch the, the plane. The minute I get off the plane, someone picks me up and says, well, the first thing uh, we need you to do is to go on the live broadcast from the church, 1.30 uh, every afternoon, and would you go on there and spend that time announcing the pastor's death? And would you pastor the people that have come to love and know this guy? I'd never met him, but I experienced the grace of God in that crazy moment. And then all through that weekend, Friday night I spoke, and then Saturday morning a couple of messages, and Saturday afternoon I finished late. and. Um, and it was just amazing. It just came easy to me. And uh, the widow uh, was not attending those sessions. She was at home, she was grieving, but they, people told her, hey, uh, he's doing okay, he's doing a good job. So she calls me and said, would you uh, take my husband's place in the pulpit Sunday morning? Would you announce it again to our church? And would you pastor us through this day? Now that, that is just a crazy situation for a young guy to handle. But I, I stepped out of the boat and at every moment the Lord met me in that hour. I remember another time, it was just so weird. I was pastoring a pretty large church and I had the biggest wedding of the year happening on a certain day. And then what turned out to be the biggest funeral of the year was also happening that day and they got scheduled almost at the same hour. There was there was little there was a, quite a bit of overlap and no one else was able to do the funeral and so I found myself in this same day shuttling back and forth in this building between a wedding and a funeral. Going in rejoicing with those who rejoice dipping back across the hall and weeping with those who weep. Crazy situation. It's interesting as a pastor, you just never know the kind of stuff that you're going to be called to handle. And I still remember almost like I was in a, a dream, almost like I was in a bubble. I was able to pull it off and everyone was happy and nobody knew what was happening in the other room and how different it was than the rooms they were in. And I remember thinking, that was all God. That was, that was absolutely not me. So, like, so today, 
here I am after 40 plus years of ministry. I'm 66 years old and still in my heart, in the general theme of following God in ministry, I still hear the word come. Don't stop, don't slow down, not yet. And I still hear Jesus saying, come. So I have given the Lord my health, my retirement, uh, the next phase of life, whenever I'm not working in a local church and I'm hopefully getting back out into the field and, and pastoring pastors and so on, I've given all that to God. And you know why I can have that faith? Because he is trustworthy. He is like that chair I sit in and it never breaks. And so, you know, for you as a pastor, I don't want you to be crazy and go out and do wild things and say, well, Pastor Jeff said it would always work out and it's not a problem. No, 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 no. It's so important that you are careful and prudent, big theme of Proverbs, about how you approach your life. And especially if you feel something that maybe other people are not doing that you're supposed to do. I'm such a believer in, believer in marriage and family, and I encourage people, no matter what's happening there, uh, keep on moving, keep on going, keep reading the scriptures, never give up. Don't believe that COVID's gonna, gonna have its way in the end. Believe that God will, will bring an end to it and that we will see good things in our own lives and in the future. And you say, well, how can I navigate this, this, these difficult things in my life? How do I do it? Uh, I remember a story was, was told years ago about a, a particular harbor on the coast of France. And you might remember Normandy, the beaches of Normandy and so on. This was a, a, a harbor into which shipping containers and ships would come. And as we have here in Monterey, they placed a nice lighthouse at the top of the cliff so that you knew where the inlet was. But it was a, it was a dangerous journey into harbor. A lot of hidden rocks, reefs and stuff like that. And so they still continued, as this story goes, to uh, lose a lot of ships and people in this inlet. Somebody had this idea. Hey, let's do this. Let's mark where the middle of the channel is with some kind of a, a, a buoy or a mechanism or something. And then let's, let's put three lighthouses up on the cliff where if you look up on the cliff and you see one lighthouse and everything is in line, all three are in line, you know you're on the right track. If you see three lighthouses, you're in big trouble. You've got to make those things, you've got to shift course until it all lines up. Well, that's the way guidance is in the normal everyday things of life. And so I'm going to give you four things, four lighthouses. And when you're considering some kind of major direction, when you're considering, Lord, are you asking me to Think about these four things. Number one, what does the written word say about your situation? Searching the scripture, not just casually and flipping open the Bible and seeing what's there, but in whatever direction you're considering, what does the word say? There's a beautiful example of this in Acts 13, 47, where Paul, on his first apostolic journey, is uh, having a really hard time from the Jews in a particular town. He says, well, seems like to me, you have judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life, never being one to mince words. You seem to judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. So we are turning to the Gentiles. And this is what he says, for thus the Lord has spoken to us. He quotes Isaiah 42, 7. I will make you a light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. I will make you a light to the Gentiles. You'll bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Now, that verse in Isaiah 42, 7 was written seven or 800 years before Paul. 
But see, when Paul read it, it was quickened to him. It spoke to him. It wasn't some casual reading through Isaiah 42, but the Holy Spirit applied it to Paul. See, that's what I'm talking about. And so you can't always be quick to make major decisions, but as you are simply faithful to read Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, Proverbs, that's what I do, sooner or later, the word will speak. Light us number one. Light us number two, so precious in my life over the years, trusted sound counsel. There are times when I just cannot figure, even though I, I believe the word is, is speaking to me and is quickened to me, but I just have questions. And having men and women, brothers and sisters around you that know you, that know the way you think, they know your impulses or your reluctance to, to change, they know you, and you go to them and say, hey, I'm thinking about this confidentially between us. What do you think? It's, it's like when I was considering uh, marrying Denise. And I went to the other four elders in this church that uh, I had planted and, and we were pastoring together. And I said, hey, you know, I'm, I just don't know what to do about this. What do you all, what would you all think about my marrying Denise Ackman? And they all start laughing and choking and, and saying, what is taking you so long? Marry the girl. And I, I guess I had my answer that that lighthouse number two really lined up with the men who knew us both. And they said, do it. Third lighthouse, so important. Do you have a deep abiding peace? when you consider that decision. Now, peace is in the heart. The peace which passes understanding, it says will guard my heart and my mind. Peace will help your mind and your heart come into agreement. If you have that sense, I, you know, I, I guess it's okay. I think it's okay. My, my friends are for it. And I think I have a, a guiding verse, but something inside you is not settled. There's not that witness or peace. Keep questioning and, and don't move. Lighthouse number four, and if these line up, you know you, you're, you're not gonna shipwreck. And that is, what does your spouse say? If you're not married, perhaps it's the, the trusted roommate or someone that's really close to you, but what does your spouse say? Because Making a decision outside of agreement with your spouse, that should never happen, or, or maybe once in a lifetime. But generally speaking, that should never happen. And if you let a little bit of time pass and you trust in God, and it's a direction that you need to take, and there's some element of risk to it, stepping out of the boat after all, let the lighthouses line up. So, you know, we're disciples in the boat. We know that Jesus does amazing things. We want to believe in what he's saying. We, we, we don't want to be called a little faith. Perhaps this is that moment, whether it's looking at the wind of COVID or it's your, your finances or the potential closure of your business, and you think, Lord, Lord, save me. Would this be an hour that you would trust him and that you would allow him to walk on the water to you and to teach you, at least metaphorically, to do the same? To trust him, put your foot out, shift your weight, and walk with him. I'd like to pray before we take communion over you now that the Lord would put his faith in your heart, put his trust in your heart. The hero of the story here is always Jesus. He's so trustworthy, so faithful, and he is able to get through to the thickest skull, his come, his walk with me, walk with me, go with me into the next phase, into what he has for you. So allow me to pray for you. 
Heavenly Father, I thank you for these that are joining online and for those who are going to be meeting outside also. And I ask you in the precious name of your son, Jesus, that you would teach us a proper walk of faith. Teach us to trust you, Lord. Teach us to be very diligent and patient to let the factors involved come into line so that we can make, whether it's something really, really big or it's everyday living, which is so big, teach us to walk as Peter walked. To be able to say, at least to desire, even if we never get to do it, can I do that? Can I walk, Lord, with you into my future? And we commit everything that's bothering us and concerning us and that we're worried about, Lord. We pray that your peace would replace all worry and anxiety. Thank you, Christ Jesus. Thank you, Father and Spirit. You're for us. You love us. Teach us your will. In the great name of our Master Jesus. Amen. And now before we close... If you've got those elements in hand, a piece of bread that symbolizes the broken body of Jesus, broken for us, that we might be made whole, and a cup of juice or wine that represents the very blood of Jesus poured out for you. What more could Jesus have done than to pour out his soul unto death, Leviticus 17, 11, and die for you? And not only did Jesus die for you, he rose again so that he can live inside you and through you and that you can remember continually his death, his burial, his resurrection, his blood, his sacrifice, the cross, until he comes again. So let's receive together the bread and the cup. Amen and amen. God bless you. Well, thanks again so much for tuning in with us this Sunday. Before you go, we've got just a few announcements for you to keep you in the loop on what's going on here at Calvary. Hey ladies, anyone else think that gathering together on a Saturday morning with some fellow sisters in the faith sounds amazing? I know it sounds incredible to me and we have an opportunity coming up so soon. We have a women's gathering coming up and it's just an opportunity to gather together with some of the other women of the faith and some of the other women that call Calvary their church home and just to get together in the word, hear a testimony, to worship, to be together, bring your own blanket, bring your snacks and food. And um, it will be socially distanced, honoring all the same guidelines as our Sunday service. But man, I would just encourage you to set aside that time if you can come and join us for the upcoming women's gathering well if you aren't already signed up for our calorie connection I would really encourage you to do so this is the weekly email that's sent out letting you know any changes that are happening any events coming up just our way of trying to make sure you stay in the loop on what's going on at Calvary so go online to calvary.com and subscribe to our weekly email calorie connection